Woohoo! Instead of fighting those horrible crowds going to look at fireworks show, I've got my own one right here. Man, I'm so excited! Yay! Happy Fourth of July! Woohoo! Oh. Do you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Oh yeah, we are back with the No Vacancy Podcast with me, your host, Glenn Hausman. You know how excited I am to have you here each and every week to share in uh, my week of pod groove over here. So, man, oh man, has it been an exciting month? And as we are recording this, we are in the cusp of July. I cannot believe it is that time of year already that we are already knee deep in summer. I know as soon as I'm done uh, recording this podcast, I got another one to do. But after that, maybe I'll get a chance to do a little uh, swimming. I'm trying to get back into doing some exercise here and be healthy for when fall conference season starts. I'm going to be on the road a whole lot. I want to make sure that I don't, you know, I don't want to drop dead in the middle of it. But if I want to take a little vacation, I think I'm going to be headed to Dallas to, Dallas to, to hang out at the Canvas Hotel. And we'll share with why in just one second. But I did want to encourage all of you out there to make Almo Hospitality your go-to partner to simplify ff and deployments for the guest room and beyond with industry-leading brands, the latest hospitality trends, and distinctive new-to-market brands coupled with their specialized business development and hospitality dedicated sales team. These guys are great. I'm finding them to be incredible partners for me, and I think you will find them to be great partners for you. Now, Almo, um, hospitality, they're a division of Almo Corporation, the nation's largest independent distributor of professional AV, consumer electronics, major appliances, outdoor furniture, housewares, and more. Simply find them at hospitality.almoproav.com. That's hospitality.almoproav.com. And if you're not a subscriber to our show yet, what are you thinking? Finding, uh, find us wherever you get your podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, all of those great places. And now on to the main part of our uh, conversation. I want to bring in Mr. Jared Williams, the GM of the Canvas Hotel Dallas. He's going to share with me why I'm going to probably wind up spending some of my uh, summer vacation there at some point this summer. Man, <laughs> how are you today? I'm doing great, Glenn. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. So for those of you who don't know, this hotel used to be a Nilo Hotel. It's now the Canvas uh, Hotel. Where, um, where exactly are you guys located? Is this in Plano? Uh, no, actually, so we are located in the Cedars District okay, cool. of uh, downtown Dallas. Okay, downtown Dallas. All right, that's pretty awesome. I was uh, a little bit uh, confused there in my former Nilo properties <laughs> but uh, uh so <laughs> i think the best place to start off with is before we get into you and what makes you tick give us a good uh, understanding about the canvas hotel dallas is all about what its focus is on and all of that kind of great stuff absolutely so the canvas hotel dallas um you know we reopened january 1 of this year uh we've got a rooftop lounge and pool meeting space um great lobby restaurant 76 guest rooms uh, we are managed by Intrigue Hotels and Resorts, which mm -hmm. is the independent lifestyle division of Interstate Hotels and Resorts, and we're developed and owned by Matthew Southwest. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned earlier, we are located in the Cedars District, which those of you who aren't familiar, we are just um, less than one mile from the Dallas uh, Convention Center in downtown Dallas. Awesome. In what is really a, um eclectic neighborhood, if you will. So... Um, you know, this neighborhood over the last several years has undergone what I would consider a renaissance in terms of shopping and food, um, art, music, culture in general, um, and really a destination for modern travelers. Right. Uh, the property itself is a independent boutique hotel. We've got 76 art inspired guest rooms and suites, if you will, um, two food and beverage outlets. It's a loft style design and decor. Is it, uh, um, and what I, I mean by I think that, it's an adaptive reuse too, based on uh, the images that I'm seeing. Is that true? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So the building itself is about a century, a um, little Ooh, more than a century I old. I love buildings um, like so that. So we, oh, it's 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 beautiful. I mean, we've incorporated that loft style design. So uh, what I mean by that is our guest rooms have 12 foot ceilings concrete flooring um, throughout the property, both the public areas and the guest rooms. You've got exposed brick and industrial mm -hmm. uh, fixtures as well. Um, so it's just 
you know, that New York loft style feel um, less than a mile from the convention center in downtown right. Dallas. All right. It's it's not really um, New York as much as it is uh, Brooklyn, I want to point out there. I'm just saying that as go. a exactly. guy that lived yep, in yep. Brooklyn for 20 <laughs> years, I need to defend my borough out there. But, yeah, it's totally a, it's totally cool. But I'm curious, um, how, how does the structure itself – being that it's that adaptive reuse product, how did it kind of inform the overall positioning of the hotel in terms of creating the design for it and all the amenities that go within it? Sure, absolutely. So it it, it was originally a, um, a Sears factory years and years and years ago. And, you know, it's, it's a very, as I mentioned earlier, it's an eclectic neighborhood. So we yep. really wanted to incorporate that industrial a uh, la feel and really uh, attract the the modern travelers, if you will. Um, you know, big focus for us is community involvement and um, just being part of the neighborhood. As, as I mentioned, it's under seeing a renaissance in art and music, and we've incorporated a lot of that to our property. Uh, you know, it's hence the name, the canvas, right? It's, right. it's kind of a blank canvas. We uh-huh. want to um, curate the experience for our hotel guests, and we've done so with um, you know, partnering up with the local um, uh, businesses here in the neighborhood so that when you stay at the property, not only are you getting to experience the Canvas Hotel and the brand, but you're also getting to experience the neighborhood and our partnership with the neighborhood. So when you're a guest at the hotel, you have different perks, amenities, and incentives at um, all these local partnerships, none of which are, are big brands. So it really helps um, no matter what you're in town for, there's something for everybody and gets you a little exposed to to the area, not just the hotel. Yeah, and that's kind of what really attracts me to uh, concepts such as this. Besides the gorgeous design and that incredible looking rooftop space that you have is the whole idea of immersing yourself in the community by bringing outside artists in to the hotel for their work or even what you were talking about, partnering with those um, – those owned by the community type of products that are with uh, with within your neighborhood that I think makes a a, a huge difference. So, um, what what are those partnerships like for you? What is what is the importance of the business with having that whole community kind of sense just outside uh, the doors of your property? Sure, sure. So, I again, I think it just goes back to elevating the experience um, for the guests. You know, I've. I've stayed in a lot, a lot of hotels. I've never experienced one like this where we've just incorporated um, the community as, as a whole. You right. know, we're, we're owned by Matthew Southwest, which is a, a major player in the Cedars District ah. um, and, and a huge reason for the, the renaissance that we've seen over the last several years. Um, you know, from the we, we partner with Simo Smalden, which are the um, art consultants for the property, and they've gone out and they've curated um, well-known local artists in the community to keep our artwork in the hotel fresh um, and engaging. You know, right now we've just launched Summer Days, which is all new artwork throughout the property that is now through the end of September um, that you can also purchase as well. So, you know, we've we've, um, built that relationship with the local artists. The head of our food and beverage um, programming and departments are uh, bar manager Leanne Berry and executive chef Gina Johnson, both of which have an very impressive resume and, and very well known in the Dallas uh, community. Oh, so sweet. they've come in and really revamped the food and beverage programming to where we've got the art inspired bites. We've got the craft cocktails. Um, again, all tying in into the community. We feature local coffee from Full City Rooster, which is just right down the road from us. Um, you know, we, we utilize as much local ingredients from the Dallas Farmer's Market as, as we can. Right. And you even um, have them featured on your uh, on, on your website here. Um, so you really want to pull people there. You want to talk. You talk about the arts district that you're in. You talk even about entertainment uh, with Gillies Dallas. So all of these things are, are, are pretty fascinating that you're you're taking such a, a, a widespread net where so many hoteliers are interested in capturing you in the property. You feel it's pretty essential to have that whole neighborhood support the property, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'm glad you touched on music because that's one of the things we do in our gallery rooftop lounge yeah. is throughout the week we do live entertainment and l- local artists will get to come in and, um, you know, they, they, they bring their followers and it's just one, it's great exposure for the hotel, but we're right. also giving back to the community and, um, it's, it's a win-win for everyone. So, um, you know, we've been embraced with open arms since we've come into the community and, Everyone's really excited about the partnership and what we call the, the Canvas Collective. Yeah, the uh, the rooftop lounge looks uh, pretty awesome to me. I like that, the Canvas uh, Collective. So how 
I mean, with that in mind, the Canvas Collective, how do you really go about pulling in folks from their neighborhood into the property to spend money as opposed to the other part with uh, ingratiating your guests to become part of the neighborhood? Sure. So it's all cross-marketing. Right. Um, so if you're on our website, you can kind of see our Canvas mm-hmm. Collective and, and our featured partnerships there. Um, you know, it's a lot of boots on the ground work and it's, it's um, you know, the partnerships really marketing our property as well from their standpoint, whether if it's, a, you know, the winery or Four Corners Brewery, it's, it's, again, an equal partnership to where we're all kind of benefiting from the cross-marketing. Um, you know, a lot of, especially with our Gallery Rooftop Lounge, a lot is really driven by social media and engagement. Right. And um, fortunately for us, a lot of our partnerships, um, they do an incredible job with that, as do we. So it's, um, you know, it's really, really helped benefit the entire neighborhood and, and help elevate it. How essential is it to uh, businesses such as yours these days to have that community rally behind you and spend money on property? Uh, I, I think it's extremely important, yeah. and I think that's what makes us unique from you know the other the other big brands um, that are in the right. hustle and bustle of mm-hmm. the immediate downtown. It's um, it, it's it's a unique property. It's a unique experience, and I think that's what modern travelers are looking right. for. Is I think they're looking for a little more than just a room to sleep in. I think they're looking for a unique experience and. And fortunately for us, um, having these these partnerships with these uh, local businesses and with Simo Smallden, um, you know, and, and, and fortunate enough for us, we were able to bring in two very well-known food and beverage gurus to run the department. Awesome. It's, it's really helped tie everything together and make it more a neighborhood, community um, place to be and a destination, if you will. All right, and that's the magic word right there. And uh, Jared, I'm sorry if, I may, if I'm making it feel like you're in the interrogation zone right now, but your property is so cool, and this topic of community building is so important to the way that I see the greater hotel business going that I want to make sure that I ask you all of these uh, really important questions to, to create that sort of uh, insight. So um, overall, what was, what's it been like for you and your experience getting that property open at the top of the year and trying to get it up to uh, max? maximum uh, potential uh, as quick as possible. Sure. Yeah. It, it's a lot of work, but you yeah. know what, Glenn, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> just, just, you know, Otherwise, me, what's the point, just right? Me, Jared? <laughs> <laughs> it just has, I mean, when, when, when we first started discussing the project right. and, and how we uh, collaborate and incorporate music and, you know, art is more than just um, a painting or artwork. It's food, right. it's cocktails, it's so much. Um, and really we were just able to start with a blank canvas, if you will, and start throwing all these ideas on the wall and see what sticks. And it's just been, it's been a fun project because we've had, you know, the rebranding with the name we've been, um, you know, we just completed our phase one renovation in January, which, um, included the lobby and the gallery rooftop lounge and pool area, as well as the guest rooms. We've got a phase two renovation coming up. Uh, at the end of this year and early Q1 of 2020 um, to um, finalize the the guest rooms and then some of the um, additional items up Mm -hmm. at the rooftop. But um, it's it's been a lot of fun just to work with the different partnerships and owners of these businesses and finding out what their goals and kind of where they want to go and how can we help them get there and vice versa. And you know, playing around with our rooftop calendar, you know, what, what artists do we want up there? What fun events do we want up there? You know, do we want to do a, you know, we've incorporated a monthly rooftop yoga with, we've nice. partnered um, with our friends at graffiti collective um, to incorporate face masks and facials and brunch and rooftop yoga. And it's, you know, we do a, a Sunday night, bring your own vinyl where uh, oh. locals can bring their sets and spin their own vinyl. And um, you know, that draws a huge crowd as well. So it's, We've had a lot of fun um, just brainstorming and getting creative and and, um, throwing ideas out there. Now, all of them don't stick, but um, it's just great to kind of sit back and see what works and then kind of run with it. And how do we how do we evolve and elevate and and tie everything in back to the main theme, which is art and community. So uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. So at what point did you get involved as general manager prior to the opening? Sure. So I was involved. Um, I joined the property in October mm-hmm. um, and it was um, shortly after Intrigue Hotels and Resorts um, began managing the asset. And from there, it was 
um, you know, kind of brainstorming and, and how do we turn this into, you know, a community centered art themed property. And, and from there, the, the genius geniuses behind intrigue hotels right. and, Re- and resorts kind of ran with it. And, and I'm the executor. I'm the one that's got to, that's got to make it happen. But, um, you know, yeah. just, just, I, I don't know if I choose with, that with particular, going... uh, <laughs> word, <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> But, um, yeah, just, you know, I, so I joined the property in October Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it was in the middle of a, the phase one renovation, the rebranding, um, rolling out all new, um, food and beverage programming, um, working on a gallery rooftop lounge scheduling, um, finalizing the partnership with the local businesses. Um, so my, my involvement began in October and a little bit of a time crunch to get everything rolled out January, but the team team just did it. (laughs) <laughs> that's insane. Team did a phenomenal Jared. job, and and it was a lot of fun doing it, and I think that's why we were successful. Right. Um, I mean, really, uh, really interesting. Um, so, what is it like then transitioning from pre-opening to opening in terms of what your job responsibilities are and how you manage to um, make it all work to create that seamless guest experience when you're trying to figure it all out on those first few days? <laughs> well, you've got to ha- you've got to have the right team yeah. for sure, and you've got to have the team that is. Um, you know, buys into the goal, uh, to the, to the storytelling, which is a big part of what we do here. And, um, you know, I think it just ties back to interstate hotels and resorts as a, as a company and some of our core values. Um, and then, um, you know, just, you know, we've got a lot of creative minds on our team from a, from a corporate level and a property level. And we're always thinking of ways to, to, uh, evolve and, and always being innovative. And I think that's, that's what you need in the, in the industry, but it's, it's all about who you surround yourself with and the team. And, um, you know, it's been such a fun project and, and we're excited to see where canvas goes. Uh, you know, when we began this brand, the intent was that it would be replicated with equal creativity in other markets. So, um, that's really excited a lot of us to, um, you know, see what we can do here and how it evolves as a brand and where we're going. And, um, you know, everybody's it's, it's, it's a, a great company, great core values. It's a cool hotel, um, it's a great story behind it and it's been, um, it's been pretty seamless with having everybody kind of buy into the, to the vision and, and goal of kind of where we want to go. And it, and it's all about having fun and we let, we let the team do that. Well, it seems like you, um, you, you really have a good sense of, um, uh, you know, business sense with adding, injecting that fun kind of element to it. Cause to me, you know, if you're not having fun, then what is the point of even having a job? We, we, we don't live long enough in order to, to, to hate everything that we do. So it's really awesome that you've got this real zeal and um, one that's translating to everyone else on the property. So how long, Jared, have you been in the hospitality business and how long have you been a GM for? Sure. So I've been a GM for almost six years now. Um, I got into the um, hospitality industry back when I was at the University of Houston. Ah. I graduated there with a Bachelor of Science in Hotel and Restaurant Management. Cool. Um, I was a I was a business major, and you know decided to take an introduction to hospitality class with a. Um, for one semester, and I had a phenomenal professor that really um, sold me on the hospitality industry and um, not only what, what you could do with it, but all the different avenues you could take, right? The restaurants, the hotels, the resorts, the cruise. Um, and I just fell in love with um, the idea of, of working with people and ensuring that um, you do whatever it takes to guests enjoy their stay and their vacations and ended up switching majors mm. uh, sophomore year. And, and decided to run with, um, hotel management, uh, and at the University of Houston. And w- when I changed majors, I joined a society called the Hotel Management Society, which was an organization within the university. Cool. And we took, uh, hotel tours on a, on a monthly basis and got to visit with GMs. And I fell in love with a really hip boutique hotel in the gallery area of Houston mm-hmm. and got my first, um, got my first job working the front desk. And I just, I, I loved it. I love the interact interaction with the hotel guests. I love working with the different departments, whether it was sales or housekeeping. And, you know, when you're working the, the front office, you really get exposed to a lot of the areas within the hotel. And at that point I said, you know, one day I want to be, be a general manager. So I've, right. I've been in the hospitality industry since 2005 and, um, always, always focused with a, with a, um, resume of boutique independent hotels. Um, so what draws you to the boutique side of the business as opposed to the, uh, you know, traditional type of the side of the business, the more, um, branded hotels? I, you know, I, 
I enjoy the creativity and the thinking outside the box right. when it comes to the boutique hotels. And I've been fortunate to where, you know, um, the hotels that I've worked, worked at, we've, we've had that opportunity to, you know, we, to, to kind of just throw things out there and, and explore and have fun and, and get the team involved. And, and, you know, how do we elevate this product and how do we roll this out? Um, I love the, the chic modern look of the, you know, the boutique style guest rooms right. and the, um, you know, the creativity when it comes to a food and beverage menu, uh, you know, it's not your, your cookie cutter box hotel. And it's, to me, it's, it's what I've always done. Um, so it's probably also <laughs> all I know, but I, it's, it's just fun. You know, every, every totally. boutique you go to, typically when I travel, I, I go to boutique hotels that they're, they're unique in its own way. And, and I enjoy that. Yeah, I, I, I love, and I say this with uh, much admiration, how uh, geeky nerdy you are about this particular topic, because I think it's just, so, <laughs> it's just so cool that you're just so passionate. And I could really tell that you live and breathe, and this is so important to, uh, to, to you as well. So um, what's it like working with a company um, like uh, Interstate and this boutique division, intrigue that they have, um, to have such a large organization behind you, yet at the same time running a property that's really based on creating intimate experiences for a small group of people every night? You know, it's, it's been great. Uh, it's a wonderful company. Um, you know, the opportunity for growth, obviously, is what attracted me over to interstate hotels and resorts. Uh, we continue to grow as a company. We have tremendous um, corporate support. Uh, the regional support has been, been incredible as well. Um, you know, they're a text or phone call away if you need um, suggestions or um, help in any way. And, um, you know, it's, it's, the the resources available as well uh it's the buying power because we're such yep. um you know a large successful hotel management company that um we get you know preferred pricing with with different vendors um it's the systems the analytics the um you know our our digital marketing and e-commerce capabilities i think are just light years ahead of our competitors so you have all that uh within interstate hotels and resorts that, that can help you and, and support you. And then you, you find ways to tie that into the intrigue division, which is our lifestyle modern division. So you almost have the best of both worlds. Um, uh, you know, um, that's, that's got your back. So it's, um, it's been great. Awesome. Uh, man, uh, last question I have for you. So you're gonna have to put your thinking cap, um, on for this one. What's the Uh-oh. biggest challenge that you faced so far in your career? How did you overcome it? And what'd you learn from it? So I think the the biggest challenge I've had in my career, um, I, I would have to say, was a a relocation opportunity I mm-hmm. took. So my wife and I are from Houston, Texas, uh, raised in Houston, both graduated from the University of Houston, friends, family, you name it. Yeah. And, um, you know, my goal, as I mentioned, since joining the hospitality industry has always been to become a general manager. And, um, you know, I was with Magnolia Hotels for about eight and a half years, oh, and company. I received an opportunity while I was at the Houston location mm-hmm. to become a general manager of the downtown Dallas location, which I had to actually sit back and really, really think about. At the time, my wife and I, our daughter was one, um, and so we were leaving all the support. Right. We were leaving the grandparents right, yeah, yeah, behind right. Right. for a career move, and although, you know, Houston to Dallas is not far for us, it was cross country. <laughs> so, well, might might as well be it, when you have a when you have a you know a, a baby in the house and you want those grandparents around not only to share the love but to share the uh, the work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we you know we we uh, we we rolled the dice and uh, took a leap of faith and said you know this is what I've always wanted to do. This is a great opportunity. Um, let's go to Dallas and let's let's try it out. And and you know the first couple of years were challenging and. And several months after we got to Dallas, we, we got word that we had um, baby number two on the way, which, uh, you know, obviously <laughs> created yep. more challenges without having family oh, yeah. and friends and support in the area. But um, it's funny, you know, my wife and I joke about it because, you know, we thought we'd be in Dallas a couple of years and then find our way back to Houston. But we we fell in love with the city and we've made um, new friends and we've we've got tremendous support around us. And it's. Um, looking back at it now, I would definitely do it all over again, but it was definitely the most challenging 
um, year or two, just having to make that that relocation and really start from scratch with it with a very young family. Right, and I I will say for uh, for everybody listening, it's it's totally amazing to me how some of these things that might be some of the most difficult things we have to do in life could actually be some of the most rewarding things that we do in, in our lives. So if there's a challenge out there that feels really difficult, feels perhaps perhaps insurmountable, then it's probably worth taking that that gamble on because when you get out on the other side you're going to be as happy as folks like uh jared are so uh jared before you wrap up i've been giving a great shameless plug for uh i don't know intrigue for the canvas hotel dallas whatever you want to do it's, it's your it's your floor go for it absolutely so definitely check us out canvas hotel dallas.com we've got a beautiful beautiful rooftop pool that overlooks the downtown dallas skyline um Wonderful food and beverage calendar on our website as well. So if you're interested in some live painting, some entertainment, some bring your own vinyl, um, it's it's uh, endless endless possibilities. And, and Canvas Hotel is, is you know it's a blank canvas. You can definitely come and and create your own experiences. And that's what we're here for is to help curate those experiences for you. So definitely check us out if you can at canvashoteldallas.com. Beautiful. I absolutely love that plug, and I hope to see you at the Canvas Hotel uh, at Dallas uh, soon enough. So, all right, if you guys aren't getting our weekly newsletter, make sure you text the word HOTEL to 66866. Easy enough. Just text the word HOTEL to 66866, and be sure to visit novacancynews.com. That's enough for this segment. We'll be right back after the commercial break with another amazing interview. So stick around, and thanks for listening. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No vacancy. The hospitality industry's number one podcast will be right back. Hey, everybody. Glenn here. So get this. Recently, NBC's Today Show came out with a list of the 10 best hotels in the world, and my incredible friends over at Red Roof made that list. They've also been voted best budget hotel brand by USA Today readers three of the past five years. Wow. And according to Medallia, they've ranked number one in online reviews for nine years running. What's more, Red Roof consistently offers one of the highest rev pars in the economy segment. You know why? Because they're careful to make sure standards reflect guest expectations, are fully tested, and also well-priced. In fact, listen to this. They operate over 100 properties themselves, so they understand their franchisee's perspective. I feel like this is where I need to pull out the, they've got skin in the game line, right? So then there's also the brand extension they've created in the upscale economy market. Red Roof Plus properties feature wood-like flooring, high-end bedding, spa-inspired baths, enhanced landscaping, and more, all based on consumer research. And plus, the first time I saw this room when they debuted a number of years ago, I was blown away. I couldn't believe I was looking at a budget branded property. So awesome. Such great customer impact. And listen to this. All Red Roof offerings come with ready rewards. The richest in-class loyalty program with more than 3 million members. And that just happens to be the least expensive loyalty program on the market for owners like you. Put it all together. There's no surprise. Red Roof has a franchisee satisfaction rate of 86%. And those franchisees, they're going to tell you genuine relationships, real results. It isn't just some slogan. It's truly how Red Roof does business. To learn more, visit RedRoofFranchising.com or call 888-473-8861. That's 888-473-8861. Tell them Glenn sent you. Back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. All right, welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast with me, your host, Glenn Hausman. Uh, you know, one of the issues that I think we need to focus much more upon here in the hospitality industry is the whole notion of leadership. And I mean good leadership. I mean leadership from a point of view of service, from a point of view of giving, and how that will then come back to you and create a virtuous circle about how you'll improve your ability to lead, how you'll actually wind up being more successful in life, and how you'll actually be more respected in the workplace. And I think that's pretty much everything that Mr. Uh, Greg Aiden, the founder of Aiden Leadership, puts together. I've had the great chance to uh, get to know him over the last few months at a bunch of events around the country that we seem to be going to uh, simultaneously. And I thought it would be great to talk about this particular topic to educate everyone here that's listening to the show. Greg, great to see you today. Great to see you. 
Or I should say great to hear you today, being that this is a, a, yeah. a podcast and all, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm just visioning you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Greg, how do you see the uh, state of leadership these days in the, uh, the hotel business? Uh, honestly, Glenn, too much, uh, too many people are still in management. Too many people are still stuck in a command control. Um, I don't want to overuse it, but it's kind of my way or the highway. Right. Uh, and there's just not enough people listening. There's not enough people asking questions and then just listening to what it is the other person really wants to share. Right. So uh, I, I think the, uh, the, the best place to start before we really get into this is how did you become an expert in leadership? Because you're absolutely right. There's too much talking, not enough listening. And uh, what does that go back to that old cliche? It's why, uh, you know, God gave us two ears and only one mouth or something like that. <laughs> that <laughs> right. That, that's a ratio that will always be discussed, especially in this topic. And to answer your question straight up, mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've been studying leadership most of my adult life without even knowing it. Um, I've been curious about this topic, how people get, get to the front of the room or to the side of the room, regardless of your view. Right. But when you, when you grow in Marriott and you see some really wonderful examples and then you see some not so great examples without going into those, I'll say that. And then also five years in financial services, helping a a uh, broker dealer grow a company. One person was an absolute leader. The other person was a narcissistic manager. And that's just the truth. So I had five years of those two examples to follow. And then I also was 16 and a half years with IHG. And again, a lot of great examples of leadership and a lot of people that were paranoid and you know wanted to stay in their silos and manage. Right. So the, the, the desire to understand the difference between someone who's actually leading versus managing was a big part of it. But then how did I become an expert? I studied it. I left a big job with IHG and decided I wanted to help leaders become better leaders because they want to, not because they need to, but because they want to. And that's, that's where the spirit or the heart comes in for me. Right. That's the difference. Yeah. Uh, that, that, rings very very true to me i think we've all had both of those kinds of leaders out there the ones that either inspire you to be a better person or the ones that you um i don't want to say cower in fear but are the ones that don't allow you to fully blossom into yourself as a professional because of whatever craziness they're bringing to the to the uh the, the table right yeah and the craziness is is easily defined as ego narcissism control a fear. I mean, Glenn, to be honest, that we could we could make this conversation very short by saying our all of our emotions come from one of two places. Right. They either come from love or a place of fear. And when a manager is managing because he or she wants to control, it's usually coming from the place of fear. And but they're not courageous enough to say, he, "Here's what I need as a leader." But I'm going to act like I'm already a, a arrived and tell you right. and direct you direct and. A lot of conversation in this topic will, will go, well, can I be a manager and a leader? Right. Mm, not a great leader because you don't manage human beings. You lead human beings. You manage process, which we all do. I mean, right. just, just getting to this point for us, to, for us to be on the phone together, we had to manage through technology. And, but how do we, do we manage each other during this call or do we lead one another right. so the audience can understand what it is we want to share? Right, absolutely. Uh, number one, I want the listeners to know that Greg was actually uh, giving me an official swipe there because I had a little technical difficulties before this. <laughs> Just kidding, but really, Not you're absolutely, but absolutely, you're 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 one hundred percent correct about your assessment of uh, management versus leadership. Now, how would you respond to to this? Now, Captain Picard of the USS Enterprise for the Next Generation sometimes didn't know. Uh, what the right leadership move was, but he would have a sense of confidence in going into an unknown situation. I know this particular thing because I just saw a clip of the show where he, uh, where someone called him out on it, <laughs> right? And sure. and he said part of leadership is uh, is actually um, giving direction even when there's no clear direction, right? I'm paraphrasing there. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And and please know that first of all. Whether you're a captain of a ship, captain of an airplane, the CEO of an organization, or you own your own company, leadership is not easy. But most of us in leadership have asked to be a leader. 
Right. Not just a, not just laying on the couch and then next day you've been appointed leadership. And I would also say that it's it's not not only is it not easy, but it's it comes with risk. But being a great leader is the person who mitigates the risk, but understands there is risk involved. But at the, at some point in time, you lead by example. People are following you, and great leaders make decisions that overall are best for everybody involved. But they're not there to appease the people following them. They're there to serve them because they know as leaders they have the trust of the people following them. And they won't follow them through fire or follow them through dumb decisions. That's kind of overblown. But as the captain of a ship or anything else in that regard, at some point a decision needs to be made. Right. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And this conversation has got me thinking. People are put into, let's say, quote unquote, uh, fancy air quotes, leadership positions without any training on how to be a leader. You wouldn't shove a housekeeper into a hotel room and ask her to just clean a room without any proper training. So I, I think part of the problem that we might have is if we're going to six sigma this thing, we got to go all the way back to the beginning and find what the root causes some of these problems are. I know that in my career, I've had to deal with um, with you know uh, bosses. I won't call them leaders that did operate out of that place of fear. That did put me in a position where the only time my ideas would be accepted is if I made them feel like it was their ideas. The ones that made me fearful all the time of screwing up that I actually wound up not being as good of a professional. But I'm wondering how much of that stuff is just mistakes because we don't know what we're doing and we're all just pretending we know what we're doing and how much of it is actually ego getting in the way so how important is training for for leadership and obviously you train people to be leaders i know you're going to say it's important but you know where what do you think in this whole topic oh beautiful question and 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 full of opportunities to just sit back and identify how leaders become great leaders versus just Managers become right. great managers. Because we just tend First to think all, that they appear out of nowhere, that there's this magical thinking and that suddenly you're a great leader. But the, the, the truth is we can't just wake up one day and be called to action in a meaningful way. No, le- leaders, in, in my humble opinion, Glenn, are not born. Some people are born with the traits and the desire to step to the front of the room and they enjoy it. But back to your training question. I believe there's a significant difference between human resources and training and leadership development. And what I'm in is the latter. I'm in developing leaders to be great leaders because they want to and because their company believes in them and spends money to develop them. So when you go back to the question of training, yes, do we need to train ourselves? Sure. In my opinion, though, the higher evolution of that is how do we develop to be more powerful human beings through our language, through our behavior and relationship. And again, our our company should want us to be more powerful in those three areas. But human resources and training is not leadership development. The two are distinctively distant. In, In fact, sometimes I intimidate human resource departments because they will say, well, we've got that covered. We've got the training covered. Mm. Eh, mm. Not for leadership, you don't. Right. And, and, I've, and I've seen that dozens of times since I've stepped out of the corporate arena. Yeah, that's, a, that's t- typical when you're dealing with, um, with big corporations. I find that the larger the, the company, the more people are put on the defensive from a a lack of strong leadership that surrounds those people, right? And I think this example that you gave is exactly like that. That person, whoever that person is, and I've seen these things um, unfold in very different ways, um, is fearful that they're not doing their job the right way. So it's easier for them to put up a blockade than to be a good leader and say, this is the way we're going to train our people to be awesome professionals, which will then come back to us with better retention, with better confidence in people and more success all around. Well, a- absolutely. And, and again, not trained to keep in this ego conversation, but if you allow this conversation to go, what's the opposite? What's the distinction between or the difference between ego and spirit? And I don't mean the Holy Spirit. I mean, coming from a place a of, of, I of don't know. Right. I don't know everything. I am in a leadership position. I'm growing and learning like everyone else. Yes, I need to make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. But the powerful leader, Glenn, is the one that looks to their followers and admits 
I'm not sure exactly what we need to do in this particular situation. What do you think? And that's when he or she gets great feedback because the followers now look at a man or a woman who says, hey, I'm confident as being a leader. I, I want and need your input. What do you say? And then they, they believe that they have a place to step in and, and offer advice, suggestion, guidance to their leader. And before you know it, the team is right. better because the leader is being humble and vulnerable. And yes, vulnerable is important to be a powerful leader. It's not weak. It's absolutely freaking powerful. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's powerful because it empowers your team. Plus, Bingo. it allows you to actually hear what the potential best solution is, not to rely on your own blindness that may prevent you from really knowing what the right and wrong answers are. Not to take it back to Captain Picard, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, he Please. always used to consult with, uh, you know, um, the Jonathan Frakes character of uh, number one, for example, and he'd have... Um, uh, I'm forgetting some of the names now, but the empath who was uh, on there for like the mental health kind of thing to understand the emotion of a situation, right? And he'd, mm -hmm. he'd talk to several people and then hear the pros and cons and then make a decision based on everything that he heard. Or maybe he didn't like anything he heard and stuck with what he was going to do in the first place. It's the same thing, I think, with um, a person who's an effective uh, a president, for example. It makes me think about how um, uh, uh, President Lincoln, when he took office, he surrounded himself on the cabinet with folks that didn't necessarily agree with him because he wanted to be challenged as a leader to make sure that he could make the best decisions possible, right? Is all of this stuff, again, ringing true to you? I know I sound like I'm not very confident asking you if all this makes sense over and over again, but I'm not, a, I'm not oh. sure on the intimacies of being a great leader. Glenn, perfect, perfect conversation. And you've even, you've even brought us back to the original point that you and I shared. If a leader wants to learn from the people that are following him or her or around him, meaning their or her, their peers, they will ask for their opinion. Then they'll listen. Then they'll thank them for their opinion. Again, remember what I said earlier, we need to, as leaders, we should want to create a safe and secure environment for people to communicate at a much higher level. That's, that's the spirit. That's the teamwork. And then when you get the input, you thank them and then you make a decision. Now, respectfully, they will not always get their ideas put into motion. That's just a fact. Right. But the leader's responsibility is, again, to, to appreciate the input, let them know that the decision's been made, and we're moving forward. But that's alignment. That's how leaders lead in alignment. So they seek agreement. Not everybody's going to get there. People are going to be outliers and, and disagree, and that's good. That's healthy. Absolutely. And so then you make the decision. And then you said something else around Lincoln. Mm -hmm. The intelligent leader surrounds him or herself with people that are better than they are in most aspects of the job. Right. Because then the team is powerful, uh, independent, aligned. And I can give you two examples. Uh, somebody I worked for at First Global in Dallas. Right. His, his view was to hire people that were intelligent, go-getters, desire and hungry to learn. And then he would ask, come back with two suggestions, two solutions to a problem or two recommendations for where we should go. I'll make the final decision, but I want to know why A and why B. And what do you think Jim would, would take from me at when, I, when he asked the question, Greg, what do you think, A or B? And if I knew which one was actually better than the other, both were good, he would always go with A. He right. would always reckon because we trusted one another and, and not to, this is something I'd like to, to discuss a little bit too, is how do you develop trust with another human being, period, whether you're a leader or not, right? You ask questions, you, you, again, you provide a safe, safe, secure environment. So you show and, interest in that human being and you're committed to the, a relationship with that human being. Yeah. Well, is this too much fluff for the workplace? Absolutely not. What I advocate is my, I advocate for people who actually spend more time building relationships so that when we need to really count on one another, it's there. Right. Instead of hoping and waiting because we've been controlling and commanding them all the time. So surround people who are better than you are. Trust that they're going to get the job done. And at the end of the day, yes. You may always go to your own decisions, but 
always you should seek right. input from others. All right, now this this is not complicated stuff. So, nope. Greg, why do we overcomplicate it all? The, exactly the opposite. Because they're competing with their peers. They're, they want their department, their area, their region to shine. They're stepping on their, their coworkers in other areas because it's their ego. They want to compete versus collaborate. Right. And if you, th- you think about the intention of someone who wishes to collaborate, even with their competitors, things get done. Now, you're not giving away trade secrets and all that. I'm not, I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying when you meet somebody at a conference, for instance, they have the same title that you do with a different brand. Do you automatically puff up your chest and tell them stuff just to impress them? Or do you have a real conversation with another human being that clearly has the interest of their company as you do yours? And if you allowed the collaboration to, to happen, what would that look like? And if you do that in most conversations and create those kind of relationships, what would the world look like? But no, our ego, our insecurities, our narcissism keeps some of the leaders that you've referenced in a place of being defensive. They don't want to share. Right. They don't need to share. They're paid to compete. They're paid to get results. And that's all they care about. But I guarantee you, Glenn Hausman, then on since nobody's tombstone that you've seen or will you ever see will say the world's best CEO right. competed, competed at the highest level so a company could be profitable for right. its stakeholders. Right. It, it may say something about relationships, though. It may. Right. All right. To be fair, it, I've never seen it on a, uh, a tombstone, but I have seen it on coffee mugs. So it's kind of <laughs> <kinda, laughs> <kinda> there. <laughs> All right. But uh, I think, you know, you're again, you're speaking a lot of these truths out there. So I think the next question I have from you is if you think you're a good leader, how do you know you're actually a good leader and not fooling yourself into believing you are when you're actually dictating things instead of really listening, creating a, a, a holistic, meaningful interactions with other people that work with you? Oh, Glenn, that's the $135,000 question. Right, and I guess this is where we should uh, do a shameless plug to hire you to come in and speak to an organization. <laughs> well, this, is, this is beautiful because this is the essence of our evaluations with, with the people that are following us. This is an ongoing evaluation of how we're doing as a leader, and it starts and stops with this, a conversation right. with another human being, and you ask the following question, how am I doing? Glenn, how am I doing as a leader? You ask because you want to know. You're not just placating someone. You're actually saying, Glenn, help me be a better leader. You don't say it that way, but you simply okay. say, how am I doing? Right. But aren't you afraid that if you ask that question, that people that might be in that spinning bit of fearfulness might not answer you in the great way? I think about I think about, I ask my kids, they're 15 years old. I have twin boys. How was your day today? It was fine. No matter how many questions I ask, they're not going to tell me the truth. Right? Wow. Again, yeah, let, let's play with this for a minute, Glenn, because this is, this is so perfect. Again, if, if the person that you're asking has never seen this behavior before. Right. They're still yes, girded. It, it, might, it might be difficult. And you're absolutely right. As, a, as, a, as an employee or as a follower, as I like to call it, or perhaps even a partner, God forbid we call our, our people we work with partners, if we ask them and say, hey, how am I doing? What do you mean, Greg? Where is this coming from? Now, they're not saying it, but they're feeling it. They're getting anxious. But if you actually have an engaged relationship with this human being, and you've, you've evaluated them, and when you do the performance appraiser reviews, you ask this question at the end. It's not always about just you evaluating them. Have the courage and the, the interest in asking, how am I doing? So, again, where do our emotions come from? We're afraid to ask the question. So imagine how afraid they are to answer the question. But if we work over time, Glenn, to create a relationship where we right. can have this honest dialogue, then it doesn't matter who's the leader. It doesn't matter who the follower is. It's just Glenn and Greg talking about how do we make each other better? How do we make our department better? Our team have better results? Our organization more, more powerful, et cetera. Then the other thing, back to kids, you want to know what I do? Yeah, I would actually. <laughs> I ask my kids, I swear to goodness, Glenn, I say, how can I be a better dad? 
Huh. And I just and I just listen because I don't want to ask them how their day was just. I want to find out how can I be a better dad. And you know what I get in return to from an eight and a ten year old? Sometimes it's this. Hey, be nicer to my brother. Sometimes it's don't make us clean our room as much. Right. Could you take us to Target more? Could you make sure we throw the football more than we do the baseball and Frisbee? I mean, it's their interest in sharing what they want from us to be better leaders, better parents, not what we want to hear for our ego. Right. And wouldn't, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you love to hear what your 15-year-olds really want from you as a man, as a human being, and as a dad? Yeah. Of course you do. That's why you ask. Yeah. Right. All right. And I guess when I say, how is your day, they're taking it literally when I guess I'm actually speaking in code. Right. A yes. code that they well, don't understand. What I'm really asking him is, how are you? How could I better serve you as a parent? As you were just saying, how can I make you happier? How can I help you solve some of the problems in your life? But I'm not asking that question. I'm asking how you're doing. So there's a major breakdown in communication without me even intending for there to be. Well, it's two, it's, it's two different questions, and in defense to your interest and your sincere interest about having an idea of how your boys' days were, it's, it's, it, you get the common response because they don't really know what you want to know. Right. So my recommendation, again, whether it's a, a parent and a child or a leader and a follower, is to what do you really want to know? Right. And perhaps, perhaps we ask a question as, What's the, what's the best thing that happened to you after I dropped you off from school? And, and be prepared for this, Glenn Hausman. The answer is, Dad, you picking me up. Right. And it may not have anything to do with school because if you ask the question that you want the answer to, you will get the answer to the question you've asked. As a leader, instead of saying, everything okay here? As you walk by and you really aren't <laughs> engaged and you never have been, right. you actually stop and say, Susie, how was your weekend? Uh, great, sir, or ma'am, or whatever. No, really, what was the best part of your weekend? And you've actually now stopped. You're looking at this human being in the eye, and, and you can even count the seconds right now. Susie says, well, I enjoyed having some time with my kids. My husband was away playing golf, and my kids got and I got to do some things we haven't done before, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, okay, thank you. Now, they may not ask, hey, leader, how was your weekend? They may not because it's not about you. Right. Leadership, leadership, Glenn, is not about you. So if we can get out of our ego and stop thinking about how we're showing up as a leader, but how we're showing up for the people following us, that's moving in the right direction. Right. I think that reminds me of uh, the book. I'm pretty sure it was put out by uh, Athos Consulting about the loneliness of being a leader at the top. And mm -hmm. that's just the reality of it. And as a leader, you almost you do want to encourage everyone to participate, but you are going to be in a little bit in your own separate category because that's just the way it is when you're uh, at the the top of an organization, for for example. So, yeah, Greg, go on. Well, no, I was going to say it, it's lonely at the top if you see yourself at the top. Hmm. If you see yourself as a leader of a team, then you're within the team. Then it's anything but lonely. Again, I'm not. I'm not saying what they've written is not true. It's just not true for me because I don't see I don't see someone on the top of a triangle. I actually see the triangle upside down and they're at the bottom of the organization to a certain degree supporting and serving and guiding and nurturing all of those that are in in their uh in their leadership realm. Right. So it's anything but lonely. It's actually exciting because you 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 come out of your office general manager of a hotel you don't summon people in there. Go right. in, come in, and tell me about your day. No, uh, yeah, your, and, and when, I hate that. That when someone summons you in, and then the worst words ever. Could you please close the door? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, see, close the door because I want to share with you what I want to share with you. Versus getting out of your comfort zone, leader, right? And walking around the organization and asking, "How are you doing? How am I doing? How are we doing?" And that's, that's, that's what we do on a regular basis. If we want to engage, we will. If we don't, we'll summon people to sit on the other side of a big barrier called the desk and, and just basically extract information out of them and then thank them for you know, walking down the hall and coming to their office.
But here's, here's the other thing. Lead, leading by example is the number one thing that everyone will tell you is the mark of a great leader. They lead by example, meaning they honor their word, they're accountable to their actions, they speak courageously, and then the people that are following them, Glenn, see someone that does speak honestly. Right. They do, right? So when we see people that are behaving as a great leader, a great man, a great woman, then we believe that's possible. Instead of the opposite is true, we want, we want nothing to do with this person. We'll do the minimal they request. We take longer breaks. We take extended vacations. We're not connected, and we're just there because we need money. We have a job, blah, 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 benefits. But when we're truly engaged, people actually show up more for the leader, give more for the leader because they believe in him or her. There's a trusting, loving relationship. Yes, I said love. Love from a place of they, there's admiration, there's, there's mutual respect, and that's how powerful results get done. Okay. The leader's job is easier when they build better relationships. So before we wrap up today, give me a story of one leader in the hospitality industry that you think is highly admirable and why that leader is so successful at doing what they're doing. Wow. Well, I'd, I'd give you one that I know in my heart to be true because of the reputation he has and what I know of him to be a solid human being. Mm -hmm. And that is Eric Jacobs of Marriott. Eric and I actually worked together when I was at uh, IHG. He was a regional director when I started in 1998. And I sat across the room and kind of evaluated the other 13 men on the team and I've always had admiration for how Eric showed up. He honors his word. He shows up with, accountable. He's courageous in the way he leads. And he's admired within the industry. Yep. And he's just, he's just a good, solid human being. And believe it or not, those traits are enough for people to want to follow you. And in short, the other one I would absolutely recognize is Phil Hugh at Red Roof. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's, a, he's a large personality but has a huge heart and he absolutely has bought into what if what if we serve one another first and then lead and that's the essence of servant leadership by the way right and, and his organization has absolutely rallied around him and um he's just he's just a great example of a powerful leader as well yeah i think as far as i see the whole notion of leadership i love that you're from the approach of giving because i think that the more we give of ourselves uh, let me rephrase that. The more selfish we are about leadership and trying to keep all the success to ourselves, I think ultimately prevents us from achieving everything that we could in our own career arc than if we had been more selfless and gave to people and propped them up. I do believe in the, the cliche of the rising tide raises all, and I think that by putting out all that positive energy, it will come back to you um, in you know, in higher proportion to help you be even more successful than you would have otherwise if you weren't giving in nature. At least that's the way I see it. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. No, no, no. And you're 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 never wrong if you share your honest opinion and, and, and that's my belief. I wish you would have stopped you, after you're never wrong that I could have played this clip for my wife. Damn it. <laughs> well you you've you've brought into this conversation what need what we need to end with and that's be selfless. Give, 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 give. It will come back. And what can you do to someone that takes advantage of your generosity, whether they're following you or not? It's going to happen. You let them. Yeah. You, you let them go. You let them go. You you redirect them. You let them know that you know being selfish and taking isn't going to work in my organization or right. our organization. So being selfless and giving, serving others is fun. Serving others is the ultimate way to to show up for any relationship that I'm aware of. And ask somebody every once in a while, how may I serve you? And just play with that question and see what happens. And they may look at you like, what the heck are you asking me? Right. Well, instead of how can I help you, which is really, really you know, what we say in the hospitality industry. But what is if we raised our game and asked, how may I serve you? And just listen. Great. What would, what would happen? Yeah, I think that's uh, what I do. Yeah, I think um, we'd all be a lot um, happier. And I have a feeling that 
when you have that service other types of personality, I, I bet it's just a healthier emotional state to be in. I bet there's a lot less stress to it, that it just feels a better way to interact with this crazy universe that we have here on Earth. It's, it, you're right. And, and ask yourself, how do you want to feel instead of how do you want to look to others? Because if you feel confident about who you're being and how you're occurring to the world, what else matters? And how do you feel better about yourself? Well, it depends on, on how you're going to measure your feeling. But right. for me, it's how many people did I serve today? How many people did I help elevate their leadership game? It, it, they, don't, they don't pay me to tell them what to do. People pay me to ask them what is important and, and how are they going to behave in order to get to what they say is important. Right. All I do is guide and, and nurture and lead based on what I hear them say. And it's, that's helping leaders become better leaders has been the best choice I've ever made, Glenn. Beautiful. So this is a perfect way to uh, wrap it up by giving you a good shameless plug. Um, so you do seminars, but you also do career coaching and counseling on a more intimate basis. Is that correct? Speaking, uh, keynoting, t- addressing the topic of servant leadership, performance and productivity as well. But my, my sweet spot, Glenn, is to get inside an organization, facilitate team retreats, uh, department uh, meetings, and g- buy, get by an immunity of a collective group of human beings to work better together. And through that, the leader goes through it as a participant, not as on top. And then I do my, my other thing I love doing is the one-on-one coaching of that particular group. So right. I meet with a group three or four times a year and then have individual monthly coaching with them uh, in person or on Zoom or on the phone. Wow. I love it. How can we find you, Greg? Greg Aiden. Uh, it's uh, greg at aidenleadership.com is the email or just aidenleadership.com is my website and would uh, love to hear feedback on this or how I how I may serve you or your organization. Great. And Aiden is spelled A-D-E-N in case other people uh, out there didn't realize that. Greg, I want to thank you um, for being here today. What a great inspirational message about by being selfless and putting out that positive energy that we could really get it back to ourselves in the form of great leadership. So think about it. Try to get out of your head. Put your ego aside and realize, are you actually a great leader? And if not, find ways to train yourself to be a better leader. There's absolutely no shame in not being a good leader. We're not born that way. We have to learn absolutely everything we do from learning how to chew to learning how to talk, right? So you need to learn how to be a great leader too. I love this conversation. And I want to thank everyone here for uh, listening to the show. Of course, you can find me at Traveling Glenn online. If you haven't subscribed for our show yet, What are you thinking? Go on uh, iTunes. Go on Google Play. Anywhere finer podcasts are found. And also, you know, Junkie Podcasts are on those uh, those sites too. What are you going to do? And um, just click that little button. Or if you're too lazy to do that, text the word HOTEL to 66866. That's the word HOTEL to 66866. And you get access to our Sunday night newsletter sent right to your email box. So I want to thank you all for being here. And I will be back next week. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.